Sidia was one of the uh, leaders of the uh, movement OTPO that kicked Milosevic out of his office. Uh, one can say the student movement and afterwards worked on um, making the strategies to fight for democracy and to st uh, fight against dictators um, available for other countries, for other, uh, for other struggles. Uh, the book that you did, you will talk about it anyway, uh, is published in many, many languages, downloaded in Farsi and so on. And um, also, uh, um, you, you're giving workshops, uh, you're giving lectures, you're really um, a salesman of nonviolent struggle. And the organization that you're leading now is called Canvas Center for Ad Applied Nonviolent, Applied non -violent struggles. struggles, sorry, in, in, uh, in Belgrade. And everything else you will tell us, I guess. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you, Florian, and, and good evening to you all. Uh, it is a real pleasure to be tonight here in Graz, and this is the second basically artist event in a row which we are attending. And this is very confusing for us because we tend to meet with activists, we tend to teach activists, and then we end up as a very prominent thing like Stairische Herbst. Sorry for my Serbian. I, we always thought that. German is this English where you roll a rocks in your mouth. And then, and then we were also invited for Berlin Biennale. And this is where we really understood that there is a very, very great connection between the ideas you get and you bring into the movement, the creativity you have, but also the artwork of the, of the people. And I'm so happy to be with you here today and I'll, I will be here tomorrow with a workshop with a great prominent Russian artist, Anna Ermolaeva, as well as the guy who really invented the clenched fist, the symbol of Otpor being replicated over and over, my friend for, for a lifetime, and who is also in the audience here, Nena Duda Petrovic. So this is going to be the wonderful experience for us. Uh, I will try to start with the anecdote, and I will start to give you the sense of what we are living through, and I will try to walk you through the ideas, and let's talk for, let's say, 20, 25 minutes, and if I'm too long, you're always ready to do, ooh, just replace me from the stage. That would be nice. My students often do this. So I will start with you. How many of you are familiar with a fantastic United Kingdom produced show called Monty Python Flying Circus? Okay, so imagine John Cleese, the iconic person from Monty Python Flying Circus, is meeting you a street, and the year is 2010, it's 15th of December, and he offers you a kind of bet, and he says, okay, this is the game, this is the bargain. I will make you look at this crystal ball, and the crystal ball will show you the future, and the future will be the real, accurate future of the world. And there is one condition. You need to share it with the world. So the moment you see the future, you go straight to the TV studio. And of course, because curiosity killed the cat, you accept. And you are there with John Cliss, the Monty Python, you look at this crystal ball, and what do you see there? You see that the real future. So now you are in a TV studio, this is Austria, you would probably go to ORF, this is very serious state TV, and there will be a very cool anchor with a you know, frozen face, one of these TV faces, and then you are telling the future. You say, look, before the end of the 2011, Ben Ali of Tunisia and Mubarak of Egypt will be down. Saleh of Yemen will be made his resignation and leaving the country, the Gaddafi of Libya and Osama bin Laden would be dead. Assad would be seriously challenged in Syria and Ratko Mladic would be in Hague. And then the anchor gives you the very strange gaze because he feels that you're, you know, going out of your mind. And you say, oh, on the top of this, there will be hundreds of thousands of people in Sukoti Park in front of the Wall Street, together with some people in front of the Frankfurt, and they're going to chant the ideas and slogans of the social justice, saying that they have been inspired by the young Arabs. Okay, that was enough. The two big people in white suits coming in, they are giving you the very strange shirt 
and they're taking you to the nearest mental institution. Well, fortunately or unfortunately, this was truth. And the year which we were witness, the year 2010 and 2011, were the very bad years for the bad guys. And what we can do and what is our major task to do is to reach out to meet with the people who were involved with these events and try to figure out what the hell is happening there. So, this is basically what we do, and this is what my small organization called Canvas, standing for Center for Applied Nonviolent Action and Strategies, is doing for the last eight years. We travel throughout the world, we meet activists, we talk to them, we try to understand their struggles. We try to help them not to make our own Serbian mistakes. Serbs were very slow learners. It took us 10 years to get rid of Milosevic. So we try to share this experience with our people. But there is one answer to this question, what made this big change in the world last year possible? And the answer is people power. And we are looking at this phenomenon of the people power throughout the history. We will look at the Gandhi, we will look at the Martin Luther King, We'll look at the contemporary struggle. We'll look to the big world movement we like to call youth quake, because this is what it really is. And we will try to look and try to understand what are the basics of this phenomenon. And it took us so many years to figure out the principles, to look at these principles, to talk to these people from 46 different countries. So this brings us to the very topic of this evening's lecture, and this topic is laftivism. Okay, we are living in the era of the iftivisms. You all heard about the hacktivism, yes? You know what it is? Yes, the bunch of people, you know, show their dissent by hacking the certain websites, by stealing email messages, by posting them online. And then, of course, we all know about the clicktivism. How many of you have saved life or fed the fish by clicking like on the Facebook? Come on, there must be more of you. <laughs> I don't trust you. Okay, we call this phenomenon clicktivism because this is what you get. You have more and more opportunity to click the mouse and save your soul. Well, whether you're really saving your soul or this is just your impression, it's yet another issue. So we thought when we look at these fantastic change in the world course of protests, that maybe, just maybe, we should dare and define the new term, the term we call laftivism. And what laftivism is, is intentional use of humor and mocking and dilemma in order to make a political change, to achieve social mobilization, or to make your opponent react in a way he or she will lose authority by looking very stupid and funny. So this is exactly where we differ very much from a traditional social scientist. And I'm by no means social scientist. Canvas is an organization of activists, it's an organization of artists, but it has nothing to do with the real social science. I'm really proud to teach on some of the prominent faculties, but basically I'm a biologist and I know about the fishes. So when you look at all of these cool guys with very expensive ties, mainly red color, talking on places like CNN and BBC, and when they are trying to explain what the hell is happening in the world, you will keep them talking about the conditions. And they will be so happy to say, okay, the change in this country is possible because we have more than X percent of educated people. Okay, the change was possible in Tunisia and Egypt because the, this, the internet penetration was bigger than 7.39%. And in this society, you can't expect change because people have a lack of the tools for communication. So what we keep hearing, hearing, hearing is conditions, conditions, conditions. And of course, they, you, the anchor, you know, nods with the head, but never asks the question, how the hell, one of the most difficult places in the world, we have all the conditions for nonviolent social change, like Zimbabwe. You have 2.5 million hyperinflations four years ago. 
It effectively beaten Serbian hyperinflation from 1993 and even German hyperinflation be before Hitler rise to power. 1.1 million of starving people live in Zimbabwe. 1 million effectively HIV positive. Do we have a revolution? No. So we say, OK, let's take back our crystal ball and see to absolutely another point of view, which is emotions. There was this big misconception that somehow, in order to deal with a very serious job of revolution, revolutionaries should be very, very serious. Look at them. Lenin, Mao, Tito, Stalin, Che. They're all very grim, very serious, and even try to portray them this way. But very unlike that, the modern protesters from Arab Street to Wall Street are looking more like the person on the right. Cheerful, cool, with carnival atmosphere, drum and whistles included, probably the very cool music playing on the loudspeakers, a lot of different badges, maybe an image or two on a T-shirt. This is how we see these guys. And when you look at these, you can say, OK, I mean, these guys are serious. These guys are not serious, right? Wrong. When you look at the numbers, this is exactly what you get. There were two American scholars, America, uh, Erika Chenovet and Maria Stefan, and they were examining 323 different campaigns, starting from 19,000 all the way to 2006. And they were looking at it from the position of success. Whether the requests of the protesters have been met or not. And they were looking at the very well-known campaigns, like the military campaigns, the First World War, the Second World War, the Vietnamese War, the Afghanistan War, the Iraq War. They were looking to the very prominent nonviolent campaigns from Nestle boycott to numerous campaigns to protect human rights, democracy, animal rights against the world. And these are the numbers they came out with. You want to target your goal with the nonviolent struggle? You have 53% of chances to success. You pick the firearms, you effectively cut your chances by half. And this is the message to those who are advocating the civil war with a foreign military intervention in Syria. You know, if you add foreign military intervention to the 26%, you get 35 so still, with the good guardian angels supporting you from the back, or the big brother supporting you from the back, you have 35% chances to succeed. And we, the Serbs, know that because we were bombed by the NATO pact. For 79 days, thousands of civilians were killed, including almost my own mom. Did this remove Milosevic from power? No. It has taken the domestic popular, non-violent movement called Otpor to end up with this guy. So these are the numbers. So these grim and serious faces don't look so serious now. Now let me show you another set of very serious faces. And by observing the faces of the guys like Mubarak or Kim Jong-il or, you know, whatsoever, Milosevic or Mugabe, you can really say that humor tends to be dictator's enemy number one. And in some of these cases, humor shows as a dictator's worst nightmare. Let us look at this very cool dynamic between the fear and enthusiasm to understand this phenomenon. First of all, most of the, these very tough guys are relying on police and military the pillars we call the pillars of coercion. But what happens when the fear melts? The sanctions become pointless. We were living in a country where people were afraid of being arrested, only to wake up through the popular nonviolent movement in 2000, and to wake up in a country where if you haven't been arrested for mocking regime at least once, you couldn't date, you couldn't get laid. 
So this is the point to which enthusiasm really brought Serbia, and this is the mindset. And when you look at this very strange mindset, and when you see these people running towards police, mocking police, giving them bread, offering them cigarettes, and throwing the tear gas back instead of really being afraid of the police, this is the place where you understand the game has changed. Because without the fear, these guys are like the fish without the water. They can't really find their way through. Now, <laughs> let us try to understand why. There are three very important effects of humor in people power movement. First of all, fear breaks down very far if you laugh and if you build up the atmosphere of the very cool party, then you're having a good chances to end up with fear. So fear is a great mobilizer of your own troops. It builds the morale and it shows the very cool face to the others. That brings us to number two. By using a humor, enthusiasm, and different tactics of songs and music and creativity, you make your movement in. And if you want to make a successful movement, you want to be in. Because everybody wants to join something which is in. And I was keep watching these professors discussing the second day, the seventh day, the 15th day of Tahrir Square demonstrations in Egypt. And I was shocked that a lot of them really expected that these boys and girls will get tired. For God's sake, they discovered the whole new Egypt on Takrir Square. Everything was happening there. The music was happening there. The live acts were happening there. The socializing was happening there. The love and kisses were happening there. Of course, everybody would go there. And if you met one single teenager in a lifetime, you would know that they never leave the square. And this is just the mentality. And when you look at it a little bit more in kind of the scientific level, you can look at the very cool cases where the positive peer pressure changed the society, and you are now living in a society, and, and we hope to live in a society where smoking will become off. And it was a group of the very cool young boys and girls from California which launched the, launched the campaign in the 80s, and ended up with the smoking being completely off in the United States of America. So the real ban, the taxes, the pressures, the separation of smokers and non-smokers didn't help while all of these bans make smoking really in. Now once this thing in the head changes, it became out. And this is a very big message for the movement. And then third thing, for some reasons, these oppressors don't know how to react on mocking. They know how to react on terrorist attacks, they know how to react on the foreign government's pressure, they know how to react on the violent demonstrations, they know how to react on a lot of cocktails. What they don't know to deal with is what happens when somebody takes their measure and makes them looking funny. Because for some reasons, politicians, you know that from your country, I know that from my country, and in non-democratic countries, it is even worse. When they spend too much time in their chairs, they tend to take themselves too seriously. So if you really mock them, this is what you get. And of course, this brings us back to the history, to the historic dilemma action performed by Mohandas Gandhi, the wise leader of the Indian nonviolent struggle, really picked a cool issue, which was making a salt. And he says, OK, the Brits are keeping the monopoly on salt, but anybody can make a salt, because what you need for making a salt is a little bit of water and a little bit of sand and a little bit of sun. We have plenty of these in India. So he marched for weeks and months from Dundee back there in 1930. He ended his march on the sea. He kneeled down, and he was started making the salt. So this is a big dilemma for Brits. Because if they arrest Gandhi, they will create a hero, which is later what they effectively did. And if they don't arrest Gandhi, everybody will start to break this ban. So making this dilemma, meaning using this creativity in a very cool and progressive way, we call this dilemma actions. Tomorrow, workshop room, 11 o'clock, we'll deal with a workshop on this. Of course, Serbs are not so nice 
and politically correct as the Indians. And because we were broke at the beginning of the movement, we borrowed the big petrol can, and the guy who is sitting around there in the audience, Duda, just created a lovely cartoon picture of beloved President Milosevic. And now we drug this big barrel into the main downtown shopping district. And there was a hole on the top of the barrel. So what you would normally do, you will approach the barrel, you will have a coin, you will put the coin in the barrel, and then by the big baseball bat kneeling next to the barrel. <laughs> you will hit the face of Mr. President. And it sounded very, very loud. And the people were forming a clue. Everybody wanted to put a coin in. And, you know, he just hit the guy. It was so much fun. And of course, the police appears. And now what the hell they will do? To arrest us, we're already having a coffee in nearby coffee shop and observing the show. To arrest the shoppers, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then, of course, they made the most stupid decision of all. They arrested the barrel. So picture of two policemen drugging the barrel through the police car was the best news for every photo editor in the country. These two guys became very famous. They were on the cover page of every single newspaper. So what really happened there is that with a, not very much of resources, but with a lot of creativity, you created a setup in which your opponent loses, you become cool, everybody has fun, and people get strange ideas. The strange ideas is that, yes, we can mock with our dictator and still get away with it. So this is the position you want to achieve. There will be a very nice talk after us. I'm, I'm proud and glad to have here, the brothers Sviahi, the two exiled Iranians, the people who will tell you the story of their country and their fantastic project called Everyday Rebellion, far better than I could do. But yet another cool dilemma action comes from Iran. There is a very, very cool documentary you should look. It's called Offside. It is about the very brave group of women. And you know, Iran is probably the only country in the world where women do love sports but are banned to attending the sport games because they don't want you know, to make men being upset by exposed in public, blah, blah, blah. Effectively, women can go and watch soccer. So what happens when a group of 10 young women decides to disguise themselves as a man, smuggle themselves to the match, which decides about whether or not Iran will play in the World Cup? And what if they effectively smuggle themselves and they sit straight to the place where every single camera in the stadium will have them there. So now what the regime will do? Interrupt inter international match and arrest women? Risking the, the judgment of the whole world? Or just let them sit there so every single woman in Iran gets an idea that it's a very cool thing to go to the football match. And yes, she can get away with it. So when you look at these very, very brave actions, you can see that people have came independently to these ideas throughout the globe. You want a more Master Nice thing? Look at the Yes Man. How many of you have heard of the Yes Man? Okay, I'm, I'm glad and proud to know these two crazy guys. And they're operating their Yes Lab in New York, and I, I, I was there when they were designing their fantastic actions. So at the beginning of the Occupy, the police was very clever to put a fence around the big bull because, you know, they knew that people will mess with the monument because it was such a powerful symbol of the Wall Street and the World Financial Center. So what if coming from their Yes Lab, you have a three guys, two of them, these guys, these are clowns. They come in, they approach the bull, they get arrested. The guy dressed as a matador just jumps on, symbolically kills the bull, and he will jumps on NYPD car and gets a free ride. This has probably half a million clicks on YouTube. Just enter Corrida Wall Street and you will get this clip. This is two minute clip produced for probably 50 bucks. And you can add 50 bucks of you know, renting this equipment and getting there. And you are three people and they got probably outside of the jail in two hours. 
So when you look at the invested risk, and when you look at the invested money, it's not so much. When you look at the outcome and the encouragement and the laughters, you know, it is a huge thing. At the end of the day, this is the thing which really cheered my son. There were a bunch of the protests happening in Russia around the elections. And I think Anna Ermolaevna will tell you the longer story about a lot of these protests. She has a lot of cool videos as well. But what really drug my attention is, of, you know, people demonstrating in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and Putin was very careful not to, you know, break any head. You know, they were handled with care and stuff like that. But in smaller places, they were not allowed to demonstrate. So there was a very cool group of people in a city called Barnaul, which is in the middle of the goddamn nowhere, somewhere in Siberia. I can't find it on the map, so I need to write it on a, on a PowerPoint. I can remember the name of the town. So they say, okay, of course we can't protest, but what if we bring our toys to protest on a city square on a small table? So people start coming, bringing their Lego toys and their toy soldiers and their small tanks and their small cars. And within the matter of two hours, there are like 50 people bringing their toys and everybody was taping it with a cell phone because it was such a cool thing. That if you look at the you know, YouTube show of this, you will see policemen in Bernal joining people and you know, taping this with their cell phones because it was such a cool thing. And of course, it hit the YouTube and some very progressive person in, 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 in the Moscow police probably seen it and was calling the chief of the police in Bernal. I, I, I would give my life to listen to this conversation. And of course, this can't be allowed and blah, blah, blah. So tomorrow when the same guys applied for the protest of toys, they got official ban. So there, there is a piece of paper in this world which bans 100 Kinder Surprise toys, 100 legal people, 20 model soldiers, 10 toy cars being banned from the protest because they are not citizens of Russia. <laughs> so next time, they're probably not going to use the toys made in China. Or they can, you know, make them some small toy passports. We don't know what they will do next, but you know, when government responds in such a stupid way, it ignites the creativity of so many different people that they really are coming to the strange ideas. So from east to west, it's everywhere. I will end this presentation with the iconic new media-oriented thing coming from Egypt. This is installing freedom thing. It's like copying files from Tunisia, few days remaining. And then this ugly sound of the computer, uh, the virus and the system. So I cannot install freedom. Please remove Mubarak first. Laftivism jokes as a tool of social mobilization are taking primate in the world. Whether we take them seriously or we look at them from the field of emotions, there is a certain effect in it. It is somehow related to the people's spirit, but it is always inevitably related to the creativity and art. It has a tremendous effect on melting fear, mobilizing people, making your movement looking in, and making your opponent looking stupid. Even better, it often put together with a framework for dilemma, makes your opponent getting inside your trap and igniting the revolt even more. Whether we define it as a scientific thing or we just walk through the path of creativity and design and branding and cool street actions, one thing is for sure. We are going to see more and more of this new breed of unserious leftivists, and they will keep winning. Thank you. I'm here for your questions. Thank you very much. Um,
Maybe we can have a bit of light in the audience so we can have a conversation, please. Um, maybe I started off till you get enlightened. Um, uh, because now you were talking um, a lot about uh, yeah, the, the strategies that you use, but I would be interested if you could say a little bit more how you implement them also in other countries. Because you give a lot of workshops, but there's also this book that gets downloaded. So how, how does it, I mean, very naively asked, there's a... There's some revolt starting in Egypt. How did you get? How do you get involved there? What happens? Well, I mean, uh, uh, we are we Serbs are well-known troublemakers, and since the revolution in 2000, the the bunch of group really addressed to us. And thanks to the movie called Bringing Down Dictator and the book called Nonviolent Struggle: 50 Crucial Points, which we call the non you know people power for dummies or you know revolution for idiots, because this is the way it is written. Uh, uh, they, a lot of these groups really came to us. And it's a very interesting world of the, of the troublemakers. And when you look, it started with Zimbabweans and Belarusians and continued with Georgians and Ukrainians. And first we were really thrilled to see that the Serbian revolution has such an impact. And you know, all of these groups are using even the same symbolics. And when you look at the use of the clenched fist as a symbol from 2000 to 2012, it's really impressive. And it's same one single kind of the copy-paste thing. But when you, what you really get from working with all of these groups is that you learn. And I mean, we learned so much about the Arab world, we learned so much about the, the places in Asia, we learned so much about the Latin America, we learned so much about the environmental movement. So what we try to develop throughout these years is rather the tools to learn and to set up the certain set of strategies than, you know, we really try to tell these people what to do. And don't you dare to tell people in another country what they need to do. Because they understand their conflict better than you can ever do. And you know, the only thing you can offer them is learning on your mistakes. Well, we are blessed by our stupidity. It took Serbs 10 years to move from 991 and really, you know, adoring Milosevic to 2000, really kicking off Milosevic. And every time I see the conflict in the world, inevitably, it somehow sets in the scene. Because it was us occupying the public space in Belgrade University 992, bringing all of the cool leftist people there with the long speeches, all the rock stars, all the actors. Well, Milosevic was very happy with our small zoo. He would bring the BBC, show them this thing, and say, OK, we have democracy. Three streets from there, the tanks were getting ready to smash. Croatia, the business was going as usual. It took us three months of demonstrations, 96, 97, to learn the second big lesson. Yes, we can win against Milosevic on the elections. Yes, we can make him acknowledge this victory. But once the opposition leaders split, the people will leave street and he will stay there forever. And I mean, when you look at the level of Milosevic's survive, compared to the disunity of the Serbian opposition. This is how we learn the second stuff. So, you know, when we look six presidential candidates running against Lukashenko in Belarus, of course we can tell who is going to win. This is very easy. So, we were doing this stuff throughout our own mistakes, but we were also building a different case studies. So, what we are really trying to do throughout these 12 years is making people power or nonviolent struggle kind of the user-friendly. But I, I still... I try to understand it. So I need a revolution consultant because I'm living in a country where something is going to happen and then I download the book and I call you and you come and say what I have to do? Well, it's a bit different. It's basically the, the most of the people who contact Canvas are basically already very well having idea what they, they have to do. And when I was talking, when I was meeting people from the April 6th movement in Egypt first time, they were first already using a fist and then addressed to us as a symbol. And then B, they were already having a name April 6th, named up on the day of the successful labor union demonstrations. And they came to us and saying, okay, we wanted to understand why the hell the labor unions, whenever they protest in Egypt, they get concessions. And whenever we get a, a protest about the politics in Egypt, we get tear gas. So these people are sometimes very well experienced, even if they are very young. So what we normally do, we get the invitation from these people, we do the little bit check background on the group, and we worked with a variety of different groups from, you know, environmental anti-corruption, pro-democracy, 
female rights. And the only, the only no-no for us is we're not working with the groups who have the history of violence because this big idea of nonviolent discipline is very important to win and we can't break our head, you know, trying to persuade the people into what history already teaches us, which is like you have more chances to win if you're running a nonviolent struggle. And by the way, it's far more ethical. So it's like from this point of view, we have now very small team. We have like five people employed in Belgrade. We have 12 trainers. We spend most of our lives in a suitcase and we try to respond to all of this thing from different groups. But we are also working with them on different tools. So it's not really difficult to come to us. If you have the very cool project, if you're dealing with a very bad right-wing nuts, or you just want to clean the street from a dog's shit, we can talk with you about how to make successful and very funny campaign. Are there questions, comments in from your side? No. No. Well, then maybe uh, then I, I just continue. Sorry. <laughs> you don't get off in the next uh, 10 minutes. Um, no, but uh, I, to refer also to the workshop that you are giving and you showed uh, these images of the toys in Russia and uh, Anna Yemolaeva made this film and she will be also in the workshop. Um, and, and she, to, she told me that uh, she, she wants, uh, together with you, to print this book in Russian. I don't know if it yes, happened yet, yes, but, uh, yes. and uh, to translate it and to make it available. So, uh, what, what would be in a concrete situation like this? What, I mean, there was already a lot going on, there was a lot of humor already, there were the pussy riots which were really on every newspaper in the world. So, so what else could be done in, in your approach there? Well, I mean, it's like it's, I'm, I'm, I'm by no means expert in Russia, but there are a similar set of tools you can use in order to win. And of course, they're doing some fantastic stuff. They're very cool in mobilizing the middle class. They're very cool, actually, as Anna used to say, the Putin's big problem is the fact that the cool people don't think he's cool anymore. And I think this is the opinion makers, and these are the people who are really important. And this, this is the very big country, and there are a lot of educated people. And Russia is by no means Iran. You can't operate Russia by expelling middle class, which is effectively happening in Iran today, and which was effectively happening in Serbia back there in the 90s, like targeting the young people and just giving them the cool way out. So please, you leave and find a job somewhere else and leave me, the populist, with the rest of my populist electorate. You can't operate the 300 million country without the middle class. This is not possible. So it's like when you look at these, these things, they're like some things they're doing very fine, but they're also some things they, 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 they need to, to build upon. Uh, the, the way to win in nonviolent struggle is to build from the middle ground. And this, is a, this was a big problem for the Serbian intellectual elites in the 90s. We were so happy with our cool ideas and small circles and playing guitars and watching the cult movies that we really didn't understand that we need the others if we want to win. The, the very cool way to explain this is by watching the environmental movement. The environmental movement uh, really started as a bunch of very crazy people, some are calling them eco-terrorists, tying themselves for the fences of the nukes and you know, carrying on the very almost violent attacks. And it ended up as a biggest mainstream movement on planet. We can be happy or unhappy with how effective this environmental movement is, but you must say that there is not a serious government in the world without environmental policy. So somehow this thing became the mainstream. And when you look at the gay right movement, I would really recommend to your attention the fantastic masterpiece of Sean Penn called Milk. How many of you have watched Milk? To those who have not, it's worth watching. To those who have, just take a look on the lessons this movie gives you. It starts as a battle of the small group of people in a small, very cool street in San Francisco. And of course, they're all gay. And they keep struggling and keep getting suppressed by the government. And they keep getting media and the people kind of empathy for them. But there is no middle space. And then one day, the Harvey Milk wakes up and understands 
that he needs to change something and that he needs to get to the middle ground. Immediately from a, you know, destroyed trousers, so bock preacher, he becomes a campaigner in a suit, knocking on a door, talking to the variety of people, including those who don't understand his issue. His first cover page and endorsement from San Francisco Chronicle comes the day when he hires a woman as a PR, which was this, you know, the people around him were like, oh no, we don't really need a woman. And then at the end of the day, he, he's getting elected as the first openly gay person in San Francisco City Assembly, not by campaigning about the sexual minority rights, but campaigning about the dog's shit. The issue which really hits everybody at every point. Let's learn. If you want to win, you need middle ground. You need to bid middle ground this issue. You need to sympathize with the middle ground people. And that's, that's the lesson for Russian gipsters, which is the Russian word for hipsters. These guys with the, you know, fancy suits and stuff like that. If you want to win, you need to grow. If you want to grow, you need to talk to the normal people. And normal people are far easier to ignit if you offer them something which is cool, funny, good looking, low risk, very important thing. Not so many people will, you know, risk a jail. You will find pussy riot kind of character in a place like Russia, and you will also find 80 to 100 people who are dying every day in Syria. But only a small percentage of the people will be happy to take terminal risks. And this is why the movement needs to offer a little bit of something for everybody. And there was a Pinochet guy in Chile who was easily killing the people when they strike. So instead of striking, some of them really came to this cool idea that one day, instead of really using these big tactics of concentration, getting to one place and getting beaten and shoot in for 100th time in a row, they start walking half speed and driving half speed. And in 1996, we were getting tired of everyday demonstrations in Belgrade, and the winter was harsh, and we would keep running in circles. And Milosevic was very clever. He would put the police lines and just limit us for walking without using any violence to provoke more people to come out. And then the Serbian opposition leader, and later the first democratic prime minister of Serbia, Djindic, came to the genius idea that from 7.30 p.m. to 8 p.m., the time of the Be Hatred TV news, the, the people should come out and just make noise. Everybody, everywhere. So that included seven-year-old kid of my neighbors and my 80-year-old grandma and my retired father with his big petrol canister, he was hitting it with a hammer. From neighborhood to neighborhood, from street to street, the protest spread. We, in a matter of a week, the 30 cities of Serbia were resonating with the huge sounds for this half an hour. How come? Because that was so easy. Anybody can do it. You're doing it at home, it's not cold, you won't get killed, you won't get arrested, you won't get fired. There is absolutely no way police will enter 100,000 of homes and take people out because they are doing, you know, making noise on their balcony. This doesn't make a lot of sense. So if you really want to win, this is not only about using humor or loftivism, this is about understanding the battlefield. And this is the struggle for every inch of the political and social space, and you need to accommodate your tactics. So rather than thinking about these big tactics of concentration, which means 300 of you come to one place and, and a crazy person like me talks you to death, you would rather take the low-risk tactics of dispersion, meaning what is this small thing that every one of us can do at home and will produce a change? So this is the way to think in a Russian struggle, but it's also the way to think in some more very, very difficult countries like Syria now. Still no question? I will continue. Yes. Hi. I'd hi, like hi. to ask you if you maybe think about becoming a politician, and if not, why not? Uh, 
I was playing politics when I was younger, and, and I was kind of drugged into it, because if you were born as a, as a kid in Milosevic's time, you really had three clear choices. You could get crazy, go to war, or got addicted to heroin if you're very unhappy. You can leave the city, and this is why you have so many Serbo-Croatian-speaking people around. I've heard three of them on the street from Hotel Europa to here. Or you can stay back and fight. So we were all natural-born politicians, all of those who stay, whether they like it or not. Uh, I was dragged into politics in 1996. I was elected to the city assembly. Uh, 2000, I was elected as a member of the, of the Serbian National Assembly. And till 2003, I served with the Serbian Prime Minister Djindjic. 2003, Djindjic was killed, and Milosevic was, was already in Hague. So both of the two challenges for me and I think for the most of my generation really disappeared. And this is where I got rid of politics. And you know, often when people ask me, there, there is always a political turmoil in Serbia, now we have a new government. So this is like smoking, you know. If you quit it, quit it for good. And this is the very similar type of addiction. And when, when I look at the world now, I, I think all of us who really got rid of politics and got somehow involved into traveling around the world, learning from people, meeting cool people like you, but also giving this knowledge to those in need, really made more clever mistakes. Uh, there is an there is an Australian poet, and, and I'm, I'm very bad in names, but he has a monument downtown Melbourne, and the monument says, the more nice places you see, the more nice places you meet, the more nice people you meet, the less is important where you are coming from. And the monument is called the World Citizen. So I, I, I think if you have talent, and you have a kind of the mo mobilization spirit, and if you can feel that you can help the world, go for it. This is going to help people around you, but this also help you to grow and to understand the world in completely a different thing. This is a very long answer to your question. Uh, uh, po politics can be, can be thrilling, but there are so many much more thrilling things around the globe. Right. Another question, last one. Then I would uh, maybe just... Uh, Okay. Uh, the beer, uh, not the day, but the beer. The beer comes. Um, but before I, uh, one, one last question that I would have is, in a way, you are um, a great simplifier. You're kind of like the, 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 like the books of Gene Sharp with all these ideas about uh, nonviolence uh, revolution and so on. And then look, to look at the book of Canvas, which is like a, a scout's book, like how to build a tent. Uh, there's described how to organize a demonstration in a way. Uh, and also how you, so, and you said it, you need to reach the middle ground, you need to reach a lot of people, you cannot stay in a sect and, and, and so on. Is there a danger for you, uh, did you ever feel that there's a limit, that, that it gets dangerous to simplify too much? For example, people think this is going to be too easy or, um, yeah, is there a limit to, to, to making things accessible? Well, I mean, when you look at the history of the contemporary world, and specifically when you look at the 20th century, which is very important, Uh, you can see how we as a civilization really submitted somehow to the violent struggle. I mean, let, let, me, let me walk you really fast through this. It's like the first big conflict in the a, in a, in a 20th century, the First World War was about your country and Germany getting to the you know, imperial world a little bit too late and wanting to share a little bit of all these rich places. And then, you know, the war come and go and the millions of people were dead And then at the end of the day, when you look at the consequence, and in history you only look at the consequence, this is the really thing what matter. The imperial power only redistributed. The really sheer consequence of the First World War was, of course, the Second World War. And then you go through the Second World War, and when you look what the Second World War was about, it was a world of the three ideologies. The, the, the right-wing ideology in a place like Germany and Japan and Italy, the liberal capitalism ideology in some other countries and leftist communist ideology in third countries. And what basically happened is that two guys went to bed and get rid of the third guy, and then they build this build wall and, and make the be beginning of another long war, which we call the Cold War. And then during the Cold War, you had all of this stupid proxy war happening in different corners in the world because everybody was too full of nukes 
to really think about starting, you know, this kind of the big war. But when you look at the consequences of this war, there were not many. But when I ask you, how many movies have you seen about the Vietnam? Tens? Dozens? Hundreds? One simple, stupid proxy of the Cold War. How many pages in your history notebook is committed to wars? And now when you look at the contemporary history of the nonviolent conflict, starting with Gandhi, you can see that the Gandhi's achievement was the beginning of the end of the colonialism as we know it. And then we can go a little bit further and talk about the Martin Luther King, who started one big movement. That movement ended with Nelson Mandela on a different part of the world 30 years after. But when you look at a world in which it is very harsh politically rude and socially incorrect to judge somebody by the color of skin, in which we live in 2012, and by the way, this is the, war, or the world in which uh, the first black president of the United States is struggling to be re-elected, but he's still black. So, I mean, when you look at the consequences of these movements, when you look at the Lech Walesa, the crazy guy with no school, organizing a shipyard workers in Gdańsk, and that started as a movement for making labor unions, continued with kicking out one million Soviet troops from Poland, ended up with the fall of Berlin Wall and the beginning of the Europe as we know it. So when you look at these consequences, they are far more dramatic. So I think the truth is around us and we need somehow to understand it. <laughs> it's a great that trick, I will, I will remember it. I make you talk more so I can interrupt you. Um, thanks oh. a lot for your talk uh, and uh, the workshop tomorrow, I, I'm not sure that there are still places available, but perhaps, are there? Yes. I think so, so you can maybe drop by there, not? You can try to get in. So 11 o'clock, everybody welcome. Uh, Anna Ermolaeva, the great Russian artist, Nenad Petrich Duda, the real artist which we had in Otpor, the, the author of The Clenched Fist. And I will try not to steal too much of your time. Pleasure being with you tonight. Let's have a beer. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot.